بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome everybody to the Sufina Society Nothing But Facts live stream <coughs> On a Tuesday in which we open up with We got that photo ready? Uh, or you want to get it? You, you need a second All right On a day in which we study the Qur'an and the tafsir of, of the Qur'an, and Tuesdays we always do tafsir. So let's get to that right away. And I have another presentation for you to, today, which is uh, what the title of the stream says today. Who are the extraterrestrials? Are there extraterrestrials? Are there aliens? All these questions that may seem silly, but I'm going to give you an answer that's, um, that'll make you really think. But first... Let us, um, if you want to get physically fit and memorize Quran at the same time, there's an organization for you. It's called 114.1. The organization is called 114. And the website is 114.1. You can uh, sign up, you memorize a couple surahs, and you run the, you, you run the commensurate amount. It's a good organization. You got to be physically fit. Happiness is not just all mental and um, even spiritual. It's part of its physical fitness. Like the ruh is manfuq inside of us. Okay? And so you could tell that the ruh, we are affected by oxygen. You get a lot of oxygen, you feel great. You get fresh oxygen, fresh air, okay, you, you feel good. You get stifled up. You feel terrible. So, so how a person feels is not just limited to uh, to spiritual matters. It's also breath. So when you run, what are you doing? You're getting a lot of oxygen in your body, a lot of air. And you feel good about yourselves. The only problem with running is the knees issue. And it really takes its toll eventually. That's why inclined walking or cyc cycling like a, on a bike or inside a, like a stationary bike or an actual bike is he, is probably even better for you in the long term. All right, let's go now. Surah to Saf. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sabbah lillahi ma fi al-samawat wa ma fi al-ard. Wa huwa al-aziz al-hakim. Ya ayu al-ladina amanu. Lima taqulun ma la taf'alun. This surah points to the second type of hypocrisy. It's very important for us to understand that there are two types of hypocrisy. There is a hypocrisy that's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, which pertains to actually disbelieving. The person's actually a disbeliever. But because it's efficient for him to act as a Muslim for some gains that he may have, then he acts as a Muslim. And he pleases the Muslims where it's needed. But when push comes to shove, he's with the kuffar. And there's a lot of those even today. The Muslims don't have to be a strong po a political body for those types of hypocrites to exist. A strong Muslim family that has a lot of money, that has a lot of fun. One of the, their kids may not actually truly be a believer, but why would he give up this? Uh, uh, he doesn't want to give it up. Okay? So that's a type of um, uh, nifaq. That is the nifaq of aqidah. He actually doesn't believe. Now this surah is not talking about that. This surah is talking about the nifaq of action. And that nifaq is you say one thing, you do the opposite thing. Now we have to put parameters to that. Because every preacher is also a sinner. Why? Because every human being is a sinner, right? And preachers are human beings. So how then does every preacher, is, is he a munafiq? No, he's incomplete if he makes tawbah. He's just incomplete. Provided that his sin is something that overcomes him and he makes tawbah. But the moment he becomes accepting of that behavior, that's the separation. The moment this person accepts that behavior and shamelessly continues to advocate the opposite of it while accepting it for himself, then at that point he's going to have it. Now what's the sign that a person has accepted it for himself? They no longer make tawbah for it. They no longer, for example, um, hide it. They're not embarrassed of it. There are many signs. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. 
there are many signs for some, but for for us to realize that a person has become accepting of their sin. <laughs> Pardon me here, I got caught in catching a little bit of a cold that's going around. Everyone's getting it. قال المفسرون إن المؤمنين قالوا لو نعلم أي الأعمال أحب إلى الله عز وجل عملناه ولا بذلنا فيه أموالنا وفسنا. If we knew what is the best of deeds for us to do, we'd spend all our time doing it and all our money doing it. So Allah revealed إن الله يحب الذين يقاتلون في سبيله صفا كأنهم بنيان مرسوس. What is the best of deeds? The military. A sound and, and and a sound, an organized, a systematic military, and that's the specific and direct meaning. But yuqatiluna can also come to many other meanings. Okay, yuqatilun. In this case, it's the military, but we could also say, in the absence of that, it's any amal salih fi sabilillah. Any mujahid that involves some struggle, some da'wah that is uh, uh, organized. And Allah loves order. Some people love, they want to have a, they have a concept of nature and what's natural. And what's natural is, some, is, is not orderly. Like, you never see straight lines in nature, right? Nature is like, has a flow to it but the human being is not always natural we're not animals we have things about us that are not quote unquote natural and or straight lines crisp order hierarchies things like this okay and so reason rationality calculation all of that is praised in allah saying as if they are bricks lined up together like, you'll never see that in nature. You'll never see pebbles. If you see a bunch of pebbles, you'll never see them in a line, and you'll never see them the same size. But we're not. That's not our guidance. And that's not what we are. What we are. Okay? So just because something's natural doesn't mean it's appropriate for the human being. All right? So, كَأَنَّهُمْ بُنْيَانٌ مَرْسُوسٌ All right? فَابْتَلُوا بِذَلِكَ يَوْمُ أُحُدٌ فابتلوا. They were now, if battle and jihad is what you call claim that you, you wanted what Allah loves, all right, let's give it to you. Here we go, battle of Uhud. Those who were actually believers who said this word, we wish to know what is the best deed in the sight of Allah so we could do it, they passed the test. They went to Uhud and they fought. Okay. However, the munafiqeen were pulled out of that. They were exposed and they left 300 people who were either munafiqeen or they had some traces of hypocrisy or they had the hypocrisy of action. See, every munafiq of aqidah also has a hypocrisy of action by nature. If he's a munafiq in his belief, then he will reveal someday the hypocrisy of his action. But someone who has hypocrisy of action is not necessar necessarily a hypocrite of beliefs. Okay? قال محمد بن كعب لما أخبر الله تعالى رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم بثواب شهداء بدر قالت الصحابة لئن لقينا بعده قتالا لنفرغن فيه وسعنا ففروا يوم أحد فعيرهم الله بهذه الآية okay. So the Sahaba here made some young Sahaba made a claim Okay They made a claim. They heard all the praise of the warriors and the fighters and the martyrs of Badr. So they said, we, are, we need the next battle. We're itching for the next battle so we can get that reward. So Allah then gave them Uhud. But not all of them passed. They, all, they passed the test in degrees. Some of them left the battle without even fighting. They followed the, the Munafiq Abdullah bin Ubay, they've been Salul. Others of them, they fought, but when the tide of the battle turned, they ran away. So they mixed good deeds with bad deeds. 
and other of them did not run away at all, such as the Amir in the uh, uh, at the top of the, bar, uh, the 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 mountain of Uhud, the one that the Prophet put in charge. He didn't run away; he fought. He he never ran away, so he passed it one hundred percent. So some passed it fully, some had mixed deeds, and some went with the hypocrites. Okay. And so this is was what Muhammad ibn Kab says. Okay. Nazalat fi shatn al qital. This ayah, the Haq says, it has come down in 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 about Uhud. Why do you say oh you who believe, why do you say something that you do not do? Why would why did you want jihad and you want to go fight for the sake of Allah, but when the time comes, you all, you didn't do it? It's because Maybe you ask for something you shouldn't be asking for. The prophet later on said, a person should never ask to meet the enemy. لا, don't even desire it. لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو. And the liqa is when you physically actually... The ba- Wars back in the day were extremely scary. I mean, I think war today is scary, but half the people in any given army... In the U.S. Army, I think half the people are like behind remote controls, Right? You just look at what goes on now. There's like 15 guys in a control room with computers, and there's three guys on the street behind the door, right? One guy's behind the door, and a guy in his earpiece is telling him, all right, there's somebody over there, right? And that's how it's fought now, it seems to be. And in Arizona, there are, there are these places, New Mexico, Arizona, where the rent is really cheap, and the land is really cheap. The army owns, the military owns this huge space these huge buildings where drones are flown from there drones flying over afghanistan or over wherever and a guy's literally playing a video game and who knows he might have other tabs open while he's killing people right he's like playing call of duty and then he goes home and could you imagine that you actually are at war and you're dropping bombs and drones on people Okay, you're flying these drones over people and 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 fighting them. Yeah, and you got other tabs open, and then uh, hey, pick up some milk on your way home. I actually cancel the milk. We're gonna go. Let's meet out at Taco Bell and eat there first. I mean, wouldn't that like mess with your head? So the act of direct killing has been removed, and is now all virtual. But imagine back in the day how scary war was. Just imagine. Two, three hundred of us, there's a, a, an enemy coming and bothering our, 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 our little town and our little city. We got to go deal with them. Take your swords. Take uh, your shields. And you, we all leave that day. We wake up that morning. We all leave. We don't know who's coming back blind, dead, amputated. Sometimes to think about, you might as well just better off to die than some of these amputations, some of these... Uh, injuries that happen in battle and the worst possible situation is that you get a life-altering injury and you lose the battle you get a life-altering injury and you win the battle at least the goal has been achieved the city's been saved and and in old warfare the result is right there like we saved the city whereas today when you win a battle when you win a war like is there an immediate result like you don't, there's not necessarily a result. So America won Desert Storm one, Desert Storm, which is Iraq one, right? 1991, 92. The average life of a soldier did not change before or after. If they had lost that war, the average life of a soldier would not have changed. Okay. It wouldn't have changed. So it's like the direct result of these things are, are they don't change. But in old war, the risk is high, but the result is high, the reward is high, everything is high. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, do not seek to meet these people, the enemy. Don't desire it because when things go good, that's one of the options. And they go really good, but when things go bad, they go really bad too. There's almost like never a middle. Okay. Can a rajulu yaqul? A man used to say from the Sahaba, okay. okay, so, 
وطعنتو ولم يطعن وضربتو ولم يضرب This is good grammar lesson right here One of the men would come out of the battle from the munafiqeen or from a sinners from one of the sinners and he used to say I killed and I fought and he never fought and I was stabbed and he was never stabbed and I struck and he never struck anybody because in those battles it's so crazy and it's so dusty okay all right that no one knows what's going on you can go back and make up any story you want right there's no uh there's no record keeping so Allah is saying this is why do you say things that you didn't do but Allah calls them believers ya ayyuhalladhina amanu lima taquluna ma tafaru the other meaning of this could be the khitab is for the generality but the specific people doing it may may or may not have been believers okay but the believers within the, the community does not know who's munafiq and who's not qala ibn zaid nazalat fil munafiqi so that's exactly what we were saying it's the khitab is for the general community of believers but the specific address is for the hypocrites amongst them whom the believers do not know who's who okay can we adun an nasr al mu'minin wa hum kadhibun the munafiqs when they used to come out of the battles and there's dust everywhere and nobody can see what's happening they used to come and recount all sorts of stories okay that they made up which they never did okay they never performed these feats and or made these achievements كبر مقت عند الله أن تقول ما لا تفعلون. It's a big مقت. It's a big sin in the sight of Allah. Okay. أي عظم ذلك في المقت. The anger. مقت هو الغضب والبغض. It is a, a great anger you arouse. Okay, and of course. Anger is one of those mutashabihat. So the anger is that Allah Ta'ala replaces his mercy with punishment. And we are not like the Christians. This is Aqidah point, by the way. Listen up. We're not like the Christians who say that evil is the absence of good. Evil may be in sometimes the absence of good. But evil is, harm is something that exists. Min sharri ma khalaq. Allah says in Surah Al-Falaq, from the evil which he created. Allah created bad things. Bad things are not just the absence of mercy. Although the absence of mercy is one of the bad things. Right? There's no doubt about the absence of mercy is one of the bad things. But evil is a thing that Allah created. Negativity, harm, all that is something that Allah, it itself, an entity in itself that Allah created. And we have, if you look at the ahadith of the dhikr of la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, you find some of the ahadith that bala comes down upon people. If you look at dua, bala is a bad thing that comes down upon somebody, okay? But his dua may be a shield from it. So it'll still come down, but his dua is an umbrella. And someone stronger of God and dua is like a roof, a tent, or a house, or a massive building, right? All coverages are not the same. A hood is not like an umbrella. An umbrella is not like a car. Or a tent. A tent is not like a car. A car is not like a house. A house is not like uh, a massive uh, uh, skyscraper. Something like that. So everything's different. Everyone's of God are different. So why is it that the prophets are the... How is it that the prophets are the greatest of bala? They're the greatest to receive... They receive the worst tribulations. Yet they're the happiest of the creation and the least anxious of them. It's because they receive the worst of, crea- the, the worst of tests, but they also have the greatest of shields. That's why a very small test uh, that you have no shield for will hurt you badly. A huge test and you have a huge shield. You go out safely. Safely here doesn't mean that you, you won't physically be affected by anything. It means that your heart will not be quaked. Your anxiety will not go up. Okay? Or, or it will not go up so much. You're always going to have anxiety. Even MBA have anxiety. But they won't. it won't go so far up to become uh, uh, a... Uh, something that's truly affecting your mental state. That never happens to the Anbiya and to the Prophets and the Awliya. Why? Because their remembrance of Allah is like a, a huge military complex that's sp- stopping all this bala 
and, and putting a shield to it. That's why when you're in their presence, you, you live differently. Okay, because you're in the presence of their shields too. So, al maqt wal ghadab wal bogd, they're not to be understood anthropomorphically, such as that the heating up of the heart to the point that you have to do something and you're angry, this is not the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. The attribute of Allah ta'ala is that he punishes. When he's angered, he punishes. That's what it means. And there's a big difference too because human beings, when, they, when we get angry and we respond quickly, that's actually based, one of the basis for that, prerequisites of that, is ignorance, right? So someone comes and pokes me on the side and I get startled and I attack back. Well, it's because I was surprised and the creator never gets surprised. Okay, so part of anger and the anthropomorphic version of human anger is ignorance or inability to react or lack of knowledge of the wisdom. Okay, so why is it that when uh, if a doctor pricks me and um, some other prankster pricks me, I have a different reaction because I have knowledge of one. I know that it's coming and I know the wisdom. So I accept it. No reaction. I even thank him. Right. But when I don't know the, I don't have knowledge of it and I don't know the wisdom. I get angry and I respond with attack. So that's one of the important differences between the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the anger of, uh, uh, of, of, of creation. Okay. Uh, Lambik, Lambik, there's someone called Lambik, Lamsik. When this guy going to talk about aliens and UFOs? His parent never raised him, I'm sorry to say that. His, parent, his dad never raised him, that's it. <laughs> never got a ship ship and talk to someone like that. Okay. In the law, you have a lady who got in on a piece of it, he suffer. Yasif. يَصِفُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ يَصِفُونَ أَنفُسَهُمْ عِنْدَ الْقِتَالِ صَفَّةً وَلَا يَزُولُونَ عَنْ أَمَاكِنِهِمْ They take positions, okay? Uh, they take positions in the army, in the, in, in, in the battle, and they never leave, okay, the, their positions. That's what it means. You have a job, you do your job. That's it. That's how simple it is. The military stuff is not that, it's not that hard. You have a job that you know you can do, do it. Okay? That's it. No one leaves their post. All right? Nobody leaves their post. And that's what it means. Uh, and they're like bunyan, a brick. No reaction. You hit it, doesn't react. Keep going, keep moving forward. Also, when you put bricks together, you don't put gaps. There's no gaps. Straighten the rows in Salah is really preparation for the army. Can you imagine if we ever had to actually have a battle right now, right? Think about this. If we had to have a battle right now, and we actually had to tell people, listen, straighten your rows. We'd all know how to do this. I'd like to say, do a social experiment. Get a bunch of Muslims together, randomly. Just get a bunch of Muslims and tell them to stand in order, right? Immediately, who are they going to turn to? Like, who would have led the Salah for us, right? So-and-so, okay? All right, put him up. Immediately, that person says, fill the gaps, straighten your rows and fill the gaps. It's not going to take a few seconds, right, for this to happen. Now go get a random bunch of people from Times Square and tell them to organize yourself in straight rows. See how long it takes, right? So, when people say Salah is militaristic in its rows, we say yes, and we're proud of that. So, don't mess around with an ummah that's so militaristic, right? How could, this is why it's ajib, it's one of the strangest things that this ummah ends up being a conquered ummah. The only way that this ummah could ever be a conquered ummah is when they're no longer practicing their deen. Okay. So, Okay, they are touching one another. What else? Okay, there's no gap in between them. Okay. 
وإذ قال موسى لقومه Okay, we stop here because here is the end of the section on specifically on being in straight rows. Okay, let's stop here. All right, let us now turn to the other portion, which is latest blog posts. We'll share with you the actual link later. Yeah, you could share it after we read this so that we can all keep everyone here. So I'm at uh, Sheikh Mahdi Locke's session the other day. And he brings up this strange question. He says, Americans are all, have always been fascinated with the concept of, are we alone? Are there aliens? I'm thinking, like, what is this silliness, right? It's true, like, Americans are silly. And then recently there were just the UFO uh, Senate hearings, which I felt were also just like a waste of time, okay? All right, so... Uh, a brother sitting next to me, he says to me, do you believe in UFOs? Do you believe in uh, aliens? I said, of course not. And he said, why not? I'm like, I'm not going to go into this while he's in the lecture, but there, there are no, uh, there are not aliens. I don't believe in, well, I don't believe in aliens. Okay. And one of my reasonings is that Allah has told us sufficiently spoke to us at length of the rational creations that are out there. Now, is it something that uh, we can say is, uh, is, is exclusive? I don't think we can say it's exclusive, right? But yet at the same time, we, Allah has given us a concept of what's out. There's angels, there's jinn, there's humans, right? And there's animals. If Allah has told us about the naml, ants, the littlest thing, angels, the biggest thing, right? then it gives you the understanding he's told us everything in between. So then, yeah, there's no aliens, right? I don't believe in any aliens. Good. Uh, or, or another planet with human beings on there. All right, who would their Nabi be, right? Well, then where, where does Nabuwa go? Okay. And they have this saying of Ibn Arabi, I think, or Ibn Abbas or something like this, where um, it says that there are several planets and on every planet, there is another Ibn Abbas on there, right? That's not a something to go by. These are like threadbare narrations that no one relies upon for any actual knowledge, okay? So I said, no, nah, there's nothing. Then immediately, Sheikh Mahdi says, in this speech, he says, there are extraterrestrial beings, and I can prove it. And all of a sudden, this young man, he says, see, see, I told you, we believe in aliens. I said, okay, listen. He then says, if extraterrestrials are defined broadly, okay, as life that did not originate on Earth. That's the definition of extraterrestrials, life that didn't originate on Earth. And Adam and Hawa were created in the heavens, according to the Quran. They were created in the heavens. Then, by necessity, we're the aliens here on this planet. There are extraterrestrials, and it's us. We actually are the aliens. Okay. Now, jinn, we don't know where they were created. Were they created in the heavens or in the earth? We don't know that. But Adam and Hawa were created in the heavens. Okay. So by the technical definition of life on earth that didn't originate on earth, we're the aliens. Okay. It's us. Now, let's actually look at this with a critical eye to see if this theory works. Okay. So... If something is of the earth, it should fit naturally in the earth. It should not be so dependent and so scared of the elements. Human beings are in complete shock and complete fear of the elements. We have to have walls. We have to have fire. We have to have clothes. We have to have weapons, right? Our teeth are not enough. Our hands are not enough. Every other animal, either its hands, its beak, its claws, its canines, are enough for that animal, okay? Even a raccoon, they can pick a, have a good fight, a raccoon with claws, canines, right? Uh, even the, let's say, the, the deer that are prey, they got eyes that go around. We don't. 
We need to put security cameras. Like, we are a nervous creation. We're a creation that can survive here, but clearly we don't belong here. We're not of this planet. We belong here, I should say, but we're not of the earth, if you think about it. We are not natural to this planet. We are constantly in need of artificial things, such as clothes, tools. Okay. Whereas the natives of this planet, all the animals out there, you never see them walking around with clothes. You never see them running from the elements. You never see them needing tools. They're created with everything that suits this environment. I would think about this. Throw a cat outside. Your cat can leave the house and go into the woods and spend a day or two and come back when it gets bored. Nothing happens, right? Take a human being. Take a 15-year-old, okay? And I'll give you something. Give him a bottle of water. Give him a knife. Give him a jacket. Throw him in the forest for three days. He's going to be sick. He's going to be bitten. He's going to be miserable. And it's not just that we're not used to it. It's not just that. That all human beings are like this. I was at the aboriginals... Even they need tools. Even they need to fight the elements. Even they need fire. They need clothes in the Amazon, right? They have to cover themselves. So human beings are actually, we can survive here, but we're not of here. That means our existence here is temporary. It's meant to be temporary. It's designed as a temporary existence, okay? Let's take another example. If you have natives and you have aliens, what do you think is going to happen between the two? There has to be a clash. This is our air, the land. No, this is our land. Well, if you look at the natives, one of the signs that it, they are the natives, right, is that they know where they belong. The lion will never try to live in the Amazon. The jaguar will never try to live in the savannah. The polar bear will never come and try to claim Mexico. Polar bears live where polar bears live, right? Lions will live where lions live. They don't try to live somewhere, somewhere else. It's like each one has its own room. You go to a house, everyone's got their own room. No one tries to take over someone else's room. Someone now comes in and takes over, right? Doesn't have these scruples. We live, well, take the whole thing. And that's humans. That's us. We'll take the whole thing. We'll live in, in, in the North Pole if we could possibly survive there. Anywhere we could survive, we're going to take over. Constant clash between the aliens and the natives. That's what, and what do we do with them? We're afraid of them. We use them. We imprison them. We eat them. We make them go extinct. We do all sorts of bad things to them. And in our best day as human beings, when, when, when are human beings at their best? When they have a sense of purpose and a sense of law. Okay. Now think of you had aliens. Now imagine aliens came down onto the earth. Imagine them however you want. And I can critique the Hollywood imaginations. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. The origin, the aliens will eventually feel that something's missing. Okay. And then you can imagine as the generations go down, some will say, where did we come from? And others, we say, fool, we've always been here. Right. And isn't that the actual, re the difference between believers and non-believers, right? Some say, no, we're not from here. We have an original home. Others will say, no, nah, no, nah, that's a bunch of nonsense. We've always been here, right? But the human being is always feeling something missing. That's another sign that you are not in your natural habitat. Your natural habitat is the, is the heavens. That's a natural habitat of human beings is the heavens. It's not this earth, okay? And the only reason that we're here it's the way the, the, the best analogy is that you're an ambassador from a nation. United States sends you as an ambassador and you're sent to, let's say, Belgium or China or Korea. Okay. You get when you get there, do you expect that you need to earn your own money as an ambassador? No, not at all. I expect that. My room is there. The house is there. The food is there. I'm going to get a debit card to, to, to buy all my supplies. I shouldn't have to pay anything, right? But all I actually need to do is I need a file. When I get there on my desk or before I go to the plane, I'm going to get a file 
that file is what's going to be my mission. That's all that matters. If you're a good ambassador, if you have any sense of uh, uh, this stuff, I need to file. All I need to focus on my mission. The chef will cook the food. And is that not what Allah tells you? We don't ask you for risk. We're going to give you everything you need. What you need to fulfill your mission, we're going to give it to you. Where is your mission? Where is the mission? Where is my file? Where's my flash drive that has all my details? It's in your book. It's in the Quran. And it's in the fitrah. Okay. And it's in all these things that are signs of what we're supposed to do. Now, why don't we look at this? Why is it that I've always felt this personally? Hollywood depictions and not just all the depictions of aliens out there are so anthropomorphic. I've never believed it. It's like alien comes down in what? A, an, a, an advanced space technology with electricity and plastic and aluminum. This is anthropomorphism, right? It's like, why would you, is that, do you have such a limited imagination, right? Chances are, if there was power out there and great knowledge and intelligence, why would it, re, re, why don't we imagine it that it would re, uh, rely solely on this thick matter that we use here? aluminum lights right why like more likely there will be something way beyond our imagination but that's exactly actually what the truth is right your your vehicle is formed in your mother's womb and then your soul is put into that later on right in the middle of the womb and then you live your life and then when time's up you're taken back Okay, that's actually far more of a uh, higher power than when they bring you. And you know, ever notice with the with the alien uh, human imagination of the alien is so weak. He comes down in this superior technology, but then he's some kind of goblin, sticky, no clothes, right, no face, and it's like a massive insect, right? That it's just so silly. The human imagination is so limited. Okay. It's so limited. So this is the actual reality of the human being is the, the important lesson of the is that we're like people who are sent here temporarily. And once you have that belief, a lot of stress and anxiety goes away. Stress and anxiety is caused by the one of the biggest causes is that I have to have it all here right now. And this is the only place I can have it. And this is exactly what leads to a, something I've spoken about many times. It's my go-to target, which is people who go into Botox and freeze their muscles, right? And, and syringe themselves. And I know some people might be hurt by that because they may have done that. But I'm saying, you know, and, and it's maybe not everyone. People have different reasons for why they behave in certain things. The ruling is one thing, but we're not going to get into that. But what I mean to say is the proverbial Hollywood star who had it all, but doesn't seem to know when to stop, does not age gracefully, does not even know what to do as they age, okay? And all of a sudden now, it, it's pretty embarrassing what they've done to themselves physically. What is the reason for all this? Is because the lack of belief that there's anything beyond this world, the stuck idea of being, this is it. There is no happiness outside this world. Okay. And so I'm, and the reason I'm saying this is that most of the stars, when I was a teenager who I know of, right now they're like, well, if they, if they were stars when I was like a teenager, they must've been 20 and 30. Right. So now they're hitting their seventies or, or sixties. If they're 20 or 10 years older than me, then they would have hit their fifties and sixties. Right. So as people get into those ages, like when I see um, Sylvester Stallone, I feel sad. Like, of course, he's just an actor, but what, what are you doing to your face, man? Enough with that stuff. You look like a woman. It's like, look like one of those women who doesn't always want to age or something, right? Like, what are you doing to yourself? Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was married to one of the Kennedys and they brought her up recently. You can't even recognize them. Madonna, you can, it, it, I thought, I'm telling you, I thought 
when I saw the cover of a certain website, I'm not even joking. I thought it was a transgender operation gone wrong. I'm not kidding. I thought it was a trans operation that gone wrong and they're going to write it to us how they're suing. No. Why does this happen to people? Lack of concept that this is all, this is a temporary abode. And this is something that it has to be repeated a lot. Why? Because although we have signs of it, here's the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fairness, justice, and generosity. We have to be ready for death at all times. Yet, if you prepare for death long enough when you're young and you remember death throughout your, your youth, well, whether, whether, whether you do or not, right? And you actually end up living. Then at the end of your life, you don't have to remember death anymore. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, gives you the signs in your own body. Your hair starts to get white. Your joints start to get rickety. Okay? Your metabolism slows down. Everything about you slows down. You get more tired. Okay? And so the re reality is that it's a courtesy. Right? If you lasted this long, we'll take over the dhikr of moats from here. But here's the thing. If you actively remember death when you were young, then you will take and accept and be happy with the remember with the signs of old age, the signs of death when you're older. You'll, you'll be accepting of it. You'll be happy about it, right? If you remember death when you were young. If you didn't remember death when you are young, you're going to hate these signs. You're going to hate the white hair and you're going to get negated. And I'm not even saying embrace old age and be some kind of, um, you know, Someone who doesn't do anything. No, you could do anything. You can dye. It's halal to dye your hair. It's makru to dye your hair black. And the illa for that is actually not, has nothing to do with looking young. The illa for that. Ruling about not dyeing your hair black. You can remove the white from your hair. If you want to look young, there's nothing wrong with that. What you cannot do is mislead potential suitors. That's what you can't do. So I asked the sheikh. I asked my fit teacher, we're not allowed to dye our hair black. Why? Is it, I asked him, is it uh, mu'allal or not? He said, it's mu'allal. Mu'allal means it has a known reason. He said, yes, it's mu'allal. I said, what's the illa? He says, ghish. Fooling people. Making people feel that you're younger than you are. Because in the old days, they didn't have birthdays. They didn't know how, you ask someone how old is, he wouldn't know, be able to tell you. So how do you know someone's age? By their look, their appearance. So I said, then, Sheikh, therefore, the ruling has nothing to do with black hair, dyeing your hair black. It has to do with dyeing the hair your natural color. He said yes. Right? So I said, therefore, if there is a 50-year-old man who has blonde hair and he wants to go propose to a woman, then he should not dye his hair blonde, dye the whites blonde, with the intent of uh, misleading the woman. He said yes. Okay. That's the illa there. So the purpose there is not, nothing to do with the blackness itself. The blackness was mentioned because the majority of those sahaba, if not all of them, had black hair. So there is illa to that. So there is nothing wrong with actually trying to, quote-unquote, stay young, stay physically fit, dyeing your hair, something that is not, uh, and without the intent of ghish, okay? So if you have black hair, so that you can actually keep with the hadith, then you want to remove the whites from your hair, you would use a different color. Let's say a brown or something. So you got rid of the whites, but you stuck with the hadith of not dyeing the hair the same color as as it was before, just so that we could follow the outward uh, of the hadith while understanding uh, its meaning. Okay. So that's the concept there. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with us in, in, in the lawful parameters of quote unquote, staying young by staying physically fit. And I'll tell you what is the number one thing about old age is the pain is from lack of stretching. That's where the pain is from, right? A lack of stretching is that's how simple it is. Like, people don't stretch anymore. 
And I recently was told that there was a, a recently a problem of people who can't turn their necks anymore in the United States. And one of the reasons for that was that people used to turn their necks when they reversed in their car, but now everyone uses the screen so people don't even turn their necks at all. Like whenever you were driving, you needed to turn your neck, and that was the only exercise people got. And someone told me that in light of the uh, uh, the salam, saying assalamu alaikum, back, uh, right side and left side, that it's actually a great practice for your neck too. Right, it's a great. It's not the obviously the purpose of salah, but some say that it is one of the wisdoms of salah, is that it keeps your joints moving in a very simple manner. It's one of the wisdoms of salah. Okay. So this concept here, and the whole point, really the re- main point of this article and this blog post, which you can get at safinasadi.org slash blog, forward slash blog, and you could read it there, okay? So um, that point here is it's that we're temporary. We're living here temporarily. And where is it? Where is, let's, let's take it to another perspective. Where is it medhmoom, or how could that perspective be medhmoom, blameworthy? Like, is there an extreme? Yes, there is an extreme here. The extreme here is if it infringes, if you infringe with that upon other virtues and sunan, such as somebody who is, like, lazy, okay? And every time that he has to do work or has to aspire to something... Rather than trying to aspire, he leans on, well, this world is temporary. And he uses that. That's a misuse. In fact, the truth of the matter is you're lazy and you have lack of aspiration. And the reason I say that, that's, that's, that's terrible. That's a disaster. Right? Lack of aspiration is a disaster for your dean. If you don't want to work and you don't want to get a job and you don't want to get an education, how are you going to get married? You're going to be a frustrated person. Right? You will end up being a frustrated human being. And somebody who is, you know, like sexually frustrated, this, these are the people who, who cause problems. Okay. All right. These are the people who, who cause mashakil and problems. Let's now go to the Q&A today. Early Q and A because yesterday we hardly had any. Day before we hardly had any. So let's go to YouTube and let's see what is going on and who's talking and who's saying what. Okay, Salman, go ahead. See, that's the thing. I don't know where jinns were created, right? Now animals are not created for the akhirah. They're created for this life. That's like when people say, "Can my cat come with me to Jannah?" Right, you know, the kids always ask that question: Can we take our pets to Jannah? Well, they're not created for for paradise, but that doesn't necessarily negate that Allah can make them live there. It's possible, but it's not something that's in our deen that animals go to paradise. They don't. They justice is uh, given between them, and then they disappear because they're not created for the heavens. They're created for this earth. That's why they live so naturally in this earth. We have so many needs in this earth. We're not made for this earth. We belong here, but we're not made here. How do we reconcile the verse, وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ with the incident of Sayyidina Yaqub, he cried so much out of sadness that he lost his sight. لَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ It's a good question. Um, and the answer to that is that A, their huzn, the huzn speak, speaking of here is the huzn that is permanent and his not the huzn that's temporary. So temporary huzn, yes, you could have it. But permanent huzn, no. The permanent huzn, the huzn that has no response, the huzn that has no reaction to it, that is the huzn that la hum yahzanun al huzn mu'abbad, permanent state of huzn. So, and, and he didn't have that permanent state of huzn. The hadith Here's a question from Moab From Moby Dick Isn't Moab a character in Moby Dick? No? 
Maybe not. I think Moab was one of the characters. Who knows? Okay. The hadith that states the Prophet wasallam contemplated suicide is fabricated or weak. Should we reject it? I heard two different things about it, so just give me a second to, to look that up. But I did hear that some narrated that he, he did go to the top of the mountain. Okay. And it was Sayyidina Jibreel that held him back. Are we a few years, says Jay, from the Euphrates River revealing a mountain of gold? Allah knows best about these things, to be honest with you. Best thing is uh, learn your aqidah. Spe focus a lot about aqidah. Okay. Okay. Focus a lot on aqidah. And stu study it and teach it. And same thing with fiqh. Focus a lot in fiqh. Study it and teach it. Okay. Some of you are noting a spelling error here. I thought I had fixed that. Or a word missing in the article. I thought I had fixed that. Let me try to go fix it again. Can you make your way into the blog post edit? All right, let's now go to, can we get a studio tour? Oh, you mean with the camera? You know what we, what we want to do eventually is be able to put seating here. It's like human beings intrinsically know they're aliens, so they protect their own characteristics. They project their own characteristics upon them. Yeah. Another question, what's your interpretation of the Hadith of Bukhari Muslim? Abu Huraira said we are prohibited from placing the hand on the side during Salah. That means like this. This is what it means. And this is actually one of the more indicators that Sadl was the Salah of the Sahaba. Okay. Is that you're prohibited from putting your hands on your hips like this. This is what it means. That's actually the, one of the proofs that Sadl of the arms down was the way they prayed because if this is how everyone was praying, then no one would think of putting your arms hands like this. Okay, you all see it in the stream how I did it. Is it clear? Is it clear like this? Putting your hands on your waist, what we call standing akimbo. Okay, Hilmias. After talking and searching from all expert professor, he said that if you are not moving a certain movement moment and only focus one thing you become smarter um i don't understand exactly what he said but is he talking about uh stillness like stillness in salah maybe he's talking about because that's one of the absolute stillness is one of the uh conditions of salah mas'ud and atiq say no 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 it's not moab it's ahab okay that's always close enough because you know I told you I don't read fiction. Yeah, Watermelon 786, is it true that Coptic church in Egypt kidnaps Christian women who become Muslim? I don't know. I know that there's always a big fight uh, about that. Whenever a Christian becomes a Muslim, there's always a fight in Egypt. The Coptics go crazy. Someone with this uh, woman, uh, she was Coptic and she accepted Islam. I think, uh, they like kidnapped her. Yeah, you saw that? I remember something like that. It was really like, recent, oh, really? really? No, no, no. We sh let's get that for once. A live stream, I think, and uh, after that, like they found out, and then they took her to the Coptic church, and I think they brought her back to like. Could you bring that for Wednesdays? Yeah. Affairs of the Ummah, yeah, yeah. instead of talking about drug deals and and and, and stupidity. <laughs> what is the ruling on companions leaving archers in the battle of? Oh, they committed a mistake, and Allah forgave them, and immediately all the Muslims paid. They had like a kafara of their error by losing the battle and losing a lot of Sahaba. Uh, were killed. What happened to your dhikr ring? Well, I don't want to name names, but we were walking in a path in a stream. The stream got really high. And I had to go under. So I said to somebody, I'm not going to mention their name, hold my dhikr ring so I can go under. Okay. I go under. We're coming out the other end. And I say, Oh, where's my dhikr ring? 
I said, oh, oops, I gave it to so-and-so. Let me go get it from them. Hey, did I, I give you the Vickering? Can you give it back so I can give it back? Oh, no, you never gave me anything. And then they had a fight. And the Vickering's gone. So this is fiqh al-wadi'ah. Al-wadi'ah. If somebody gives you something, you are not allowed to go loan it to somebody else or give it to somebody else. You, here, hold my book. Okay, I'm holding your book. Here. I need to go to the bathroom. Hold so-and-so's book. You're not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to do that. Okay? Here's another thing you're not allowed to do. Hey, can I have your debit card so I can go buy something? Yeah, here, sure. Take the debit card. Okay, hey, where's my debit card? Oh, um, I, put it, I, th I put it on the table. Wait, did you take it from the table? You took it from my hand. You took it from my hand, right? So put it back in my hand. That's how problems happen. This is actually one of the themes uh, Themes in Bab al You're going to notice one of the themes is to remove khusum between people. To remove conflict between people. This is actually one of the themes of Bab al The chapter of uh, trade and sales. In, a, in, in the Sharia, so many rulings that we have are solely to avoid conflict between people. You got it? No. Wait, you, you're able to go in here? Oh, excellent. Uh, it does not love every pride book. This one, we need to save. It's already there, so why is it? All right, can you save it now? <sighs> yeah, save it and publish it. It's just the word not wasn't there. So Bab al it's focused on some of the things that it's focused upon is that partners in trade or any transaction don't have arguments, right? Don't have fights. So therefore, if, if, you, if I give you my vickering and I'm going underwater, okay, you cannot do anything with that vickering unless you ask me first, okay? You can't go let, ask someone else to hold it unless you ask me first. Right. Is it fixed? Eating them, comma the earthlings. Yeah, at that comma. Okay. I tried to be here. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know when else? What else is is forbidden in Babel Buyua is the protection of the human psyche from debt so anytime that there's debt involved and you want to make a trade with debt if the trade involves two other people getting debt all right that's called ta'mir with dhimam the increase in number of people who have debts against them did it fix good that's forbidden let's say for example let's say salman owes me a hundred bucks Omar owes me an iPhone. Or, sorry. Uh, yeah, Omar owes me an iPhone. Salman owes me 100 bucks. I don't want the iPhone. Okay? If I say to, to, to Omar, hey, listen, I don't want the iPhone. Would you take 100? Uh, but I, like, reverse. I owe Omar uh, an iPhone. Omar says to me, I don't want the iPhone. But I'll take 100 bucks. Oh, I said, okay. So I can go to Salman and say, Salman, don't pay me the hundred bucks. Pay Omar the hundred bucks. Now, there is a condition. Salman has to be willing to do business with Omar. I can't force that upon him. Are you willing to do business with Omar? Right? He says, yes. I said, okay. That's lawful. Why? Because the number of debts went from one to one. It's lawful. It stayed the same. But if we were to do a situation where we had four people and we basically traded debts, so the debts went from two people to four people. So instead of two people being in debt, four people are now in debt. Okay, That's where it's unlawful. And if you, if you look at the whole 2008 housing crisis, what is it based on? A trend, an increase in debts, constantly increasing the vimma, the ta'mir al-vimma, the number of people who are in debt. Okay, so these are two things, and that's why um, the fiqh of wadiyah is so important. The total amount of gold, says Jay, mined and owned, 
amounts to an Olympic swimming pool. Wow. So a mountain of gold doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a mile long and high. There is one man in Iraq, I believe, who is um, monitoring the uh, Euphrates River. He studies it and he looks at its, the, the situation there all the time. And he re- puts YouTube videos out there. Okay. If one doesn't have a dunyawi aspiration, like a dream per se, what can one do to find one or develop a trade slash profession in light of the sacred law? Well, there is a, something Allah created in the heart of everybody. You ever see people ask themselves, I don't know what to do with myself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created something in the heart of everyone that will tell them what you truly have a passion for. And the answer to that is, who do you envy? Right? Mm-hmm. Envy is always a bad thing, right? But it exists because it also tells you something very important. If you envy somebody, that's what you love and that's what you want to be like. So it's not about what do I want to do in life? This, the, people always ask kids this question all the time. What do you want to do in life? This is the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is who do you want to be like? Who do you envy? Right? Not envy as in he has a sports card. That means your mind is still immature. But in a, in, in a career, in a world, in a field, who do you envy? Who do you want to be like? And it doesn't always have to be admi- It could start as admiration. One of the things that happened with me in, in, in uh, academia, and I realized I need to get out of here, is that I had zero envy for anybody. I could care less, right? And then I realized, I don't care for this. This is not where I belong. Because I don't care for it. Like, I don't envy any of these people. I envy the one who's seeking knowledge, who's doing dawah, who has a successful dawah going on. That's who I envied. Like, that's the field I belong in. That's where I'll, I should be. Reminder for everyone to take ArcView. Hop on the ArcView courses because they are going to get really good soon. We're going to have intermediate level on ArcView Plus. Okay. Is it permissible, says Talib, to curse tyrants? We shouldn't. Be. We should make dua for them because if, why do the ulama say that? Not because of just being soft. Um, it's because when you curse a tyrant and the tyrant gets worse, the victims suffer more, right? Mm-hmm. Why would you make dua against a tyrant? That means that he's going to get worse and his victims are going to suffer more. So yes, he hasn't earned our goodwill, but there are victims there. Okay. And so we want to decrease it, thing, the matter for them, the hardship for them. Lam Sikh says, have you ever met a jinn? Firstly, apologize with your Tom and Jerry uh, uh, icon there, a thumbnail, whatever it's called. When is this guy going to talk about aliens? No, Edab, send an apology, then I'll tell you if I ever met a jinn or not. Tom and Jerry. <laughs> My Rehab says, how can one, one of our best students in ArcView, by the way, young lady, started with us when she was like eight years old, seven years old, wow. knows everything about Maliki Fiqh. Ibadat Tahara Salah. She's uh, Miss Hada student. How can one be mindful of death in their youth without being afraid of it? Mindful of death? When you feel so far from death, then it can, you can bring it closer to the effects that happen closer to death than death. Like what? Let's say a child, what is their biggest test? Probably their parents, right? And probably a youth, let's say a young, bo- a, a young man, probably lowering his gaze. So rather than saying, oh, I have to avoid this because I'm going to die and I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if that is so far off from you, then you can bring it closer. Whatever you do to your parents, there is going to happen to you by your kids. Do you want to have good kids when you grow up? Be a good kid. That's how simple it is, right? So 
what goes around comes around not just to death. It comes down sooner than that. You want to have a good uh, family when you're when you grow up and your kids are good to you, then be good to your parents. Do you want to have a marriage in the first place? Do you want to have a good marriage? Lower your gaze. If you don't lower your gaze or you don't do it uh, or you do it, but you don't make toba, you're not going to have a good marriage. Like someone who, who looks at the haram and doesn't make toba, at least make toba and fight it. If not, completely lower your gaze and don't be somebody who like has a boyfriend and a girlfriend and then wants to imagines that they can go smoothly over to marriage. No, it doesn't work like that. So if you don't, if you feel that the afterlife is really far away, then Allah Ta'ala has given us something else to lean upon, which is that those consequences happen in this world first. All consequences of sins for the believer, for the Muslim, happens fi dunya qabla al-akhira. And when it doesn't, that's a sign of big iqab is coming to that person. Right? The more pious you are, the closer the loop. Right? The closer the loop. Such that one of the Salihin said that whenever he, he did something wrong, so he got almost like the repercussion of that, the forgiven, the, the 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 purification happened in the same day, right? Because when you're so honed in, the the return loop is faster. When you're so far off from the from from your orbit, it takes decades by the time it comes back to you, right? So that's one of the great uh, blessings. Another announcement, you can be a supporter of this live stream by going to patreon.com slash Safina Society. Okay, patreon.com slash Safina Society. A person says you keep failing to change your way and turn away from sins and you start losing hope in yourself and the mercy of Allah that he will forgive you. What do you do? You fix that belief and realize that um, you realize that for Allah to forgive your sins, why would, it, why would Allah not do this when... He is forgiving hundreds upon thousands upon millions of sins before you. So your sins in comparison to the sins of the whole of the ummah that Allah may forgive every hajj, for example, is not going to be anything in comparison, right? That's number one. Number two, you have to understand the game plan of Iblis, Yusuf, is that Iblis does not care about your sins. He cares about your hope. Because once someone stops believing that Allah is able or willing, then that person's aqidah in qudra, the ability of Allah, the power of Allah, is gone. Is gone. He's losing it. Once that goes, all of Iman will eventually go with it. So you have to realize that that's the game plan. It's not that shaitan doesn't care about you committing sins. Because if you commit sins and have tawbah and have hope and firm and belief in Allah, then he achieved nothing. What he actually wants of you is for you to lose hope in Allah Ta'ala. Okay. And you also have to understand what Imam al-Ghazali, why we should always do tarahum on him because he gave us so much, so many useful things. He broke down sins. May Allah have mercy upon him and enter in him to Jannah to the Firdaus without any hisab. Sayyidina Imam al-Ghazali, Abu Hamd al-Ghazali. One of the things he said was that the sins are of four categories. The sin that you do, you learn that it's haram and you stop doing it right away. Just like a teenager learns that backbiting is haram and he stops. Or the sin that you learn is haram or let's say, for example, uh, eating a certain food because it has a haram ingredient. So you stop right away. Or that you learn that it's haram and it takes time for you to get rid of it. So you have to have a fight. And that's like more like backbiting. Backbiting, you don't just stop backbiting right away. It takes you time to stop backbiting. Good. The third type of sin is that it's one of the internal states of a person and you know it's wrong, but you don't recognize it in yourself. You have it, but you don't see yourself. 
And until years later, then you see it in yourself and immediately you stop it. Okay. Some people, for example, they like to so fit them between other people. But they don't see that they're doing it. Right. And the moment they re recognize it in themselves, they get rid of it. The fourth type of sin, this is what all those Islamic reminders and many others, they're asking about. The fourth type of sin is that type of sin that you know is wrong. No matter how much you fight it, you can't get rid of it. Imam al-Ghazali says that this may last years and decades. Why is that? It is to prove to you that you are not the source of your purification. And the more, the, the more that you imagine that you are going to get rid of it, and I have to do it, the more obstinate it becomes with you. And the moment you realize, ah, I, I'm relying upon myself, I can't do it myself, I submit my matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you admit that you're not the one who did it, who can remove that sin from yourself, then Allah takes it away from you. And what's the proof of that? Or what's the wisdom? The wisdom is that if you purified yourself, then you would pat yourself on the back and your ego would go through the roof. But when you put up the white flag and say, oh, I can't do it, I cannot do this. Only Allah can do this. Then at that point, you're be you've begun your, your salvation. And the, the beauty of it is if Allah can do it, then he could do it now, right, right now, right here. Many people imagine, oh, to get rid of this sin, I got to make hijrah, Right? I gotta ha it's or the world has to be destroyed. It has to be the end of time. Destroy everything. Destroy computers. Destroy phones. And they imagine that that needs to happen in order for them to get rid of their sins. None of that is true. Okay. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, if He wants to turn an alcoholic into the furthest person from alcohol, if He doesn't believe that Allah can do this by kun fayakun in one minute in this same gathering, then you're not ready to be forgiven. You haven't reached where Allah wants you to reach. Another wisdom is that you may be there already. And yet Allah may still test you. Why? Because as one sheikh told me, that Allah Ta'ala wants to strengthen your persistence and strengthen your sabr, right? Can you, how long are you willing to wait for something? How many times are you willing to peck at it, or to try again and, and, and to take another stab at it? So Allah Ta'ala, you, you may have that iman already, but Allah wants to strengthen your persistence. And he wants to show you this hayat achievement is not easy. Self-purification is even harder. Self-purification is the hardest, is the greatest achievement you could possibly do to stop disobeying Allah. You think that's going to be easy? When from college to medical school to, spe to, to residency to specialization you may be talking 15 years. You may be talking 12 years, right? College, medical school, residency. Then you, you do, you're, you, you do a, uh, a fellowship. It could be one or two years. What are we talking? Four, 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 that's 12. That's two fellowship. That's 14. Before he ever opened his own office or got his own job, right? And when he works, add another seven to eight to ten years paying off his debts so when does he get to enjoy the moment where he can say i'm a successful doctor and i got a ton of money in the bank you're talking 20 years and that's an achievement that's an achievement in society right if you had that but you still committed sins versus another guy who never committed any sins but is a regular decent job which one is a greater achiever in the sight of Allah and in the sight of his own happiness too? Because you could be that big doctor and if you're committing sins, you're not going to enjoy your life. If you're disobeying Allah, you won't enjoy your life, no matter how much money you have. Which one is in a better state? Which one sleeps better? Which one has a better life? It's clearly the one who's in obedience. So if we're trying to purify ourselves, we shouldn't be surprised that it's taken 20 years. And you may have in any other field... Get your head around it real quick and you're an achiever and you're a winner and you whatever you did, two, three, four years, boom, I got it. But spirituality can't be like that. If you did that, you would pat yourself on the back. You could pat yourself on the back for many things. Hey, I built a home. Oh, I built up a business. Okay, that's, that's just dunya. But for spirituality, 
if you want to see the result of somebody who has spiritual pride, look at Iblis. It is the worst form of pride. The, the person who has spiritual pride is the worst form of pride. Far worse than the pride of idiots, bums like Donald Trump who, ah, oh, he's got a big business. Ah, oh, I became president. That is nothing in comparison because all that stuff can be visibly lost. The one who has spiritually, spiritual pride, this, it's in here. You can never, he never can imagine him have lost it, right? It's really dangerous, spiritual pride. That's why Ghazali says that Allah puts that sin upon a person to remove that spiritual pride and to strengthen their ability to be persistent. So for Yusuf, for Islam answers uh, on Instagram, that is the answer to that. I hope that benefited. Let's go to Instagram and see what else is good. What else is there? Read it again. What about the Bible? How? Do, yeah, we answered that. What about the Bible? Um, Nati says Mark eleven twenty four. Also, some of the Sahaba would make du'a, thanking Allah in advance for a blessing, because Allah says, "I am as my servant expects of me." Yes, that is true. That is first of all. Here, here, check this out. Um, you ask for something. You ask yourself, you ask the question, okay, um, what if I give it to you? What are you going to do? Oh, Allah, I'm going to be thankful. All right. Why don't you practice being thankful now before you receive it? This is the intelligence, right? What Nati is pointing to is intelligence. Okay. That... If you are truly, you want this ni'mah because you're going to share. I'm going to share. Oh, Allah, you give me wealth, I'm going to share my wealth. Oh, Allah, if you give me this, I'm going to be modest. Uh, you give me this, I'm going to do X. Okay. So as not being to being, a, so as not being a liar and not fulfilling your oath or your claim, or don't make oaths, but, or your promise or what have you, or your commitment, why don't you start doing it from now before you received it? Before you receive the nama, start doing that now. Is it haram to pluck white hairs? I never heard that it was forbidden for someone to pluck the hairs uh, from their head, but I'm sure there may be rulings on self-destructive behavior and that is self-destructive because the hair is considered a ni'mah so you're better off to dye it than to pluck it as for a man plucking hairs from his beard that is probably also um makru because he should be growing his beard maybe it could even be haram in some of the madhabs um so that's the beard and the hair as for the eyebrows if a woman has a masculine look, then she may remove those hairs. For a man to do that, no, he shouldn't do that, right? Uh, but he may trim with, he may cut his eyebrows. But for a man to shape his eyebrows that falls into the category of sort of a man with shaped eyebrows. Wouldn't you get worried? I'd be worried. Like if, if, brother, if, a, if a guy comes in and he's got shaped eyebrows, to me, that's the behavior of a certain type of people. Right, and so it would fall under that category. Also, there is a hadith against plucking, and therefore the only time that plucking should exist is really when there's some kind of illa and a purpose. Now let's go to the rest of the body. There, there, those rules don't apply to the rest of the body. So let's say someone had hairs on their chest or their back, there wouldn't necessarily be any ruling on permanently removing them. Okay, for a man or a woman, because a sharia. Recommends the removal of hair that would collect dust and sweat and smell bad and all that stuff. Okay, so that's that's not wrong. However, the hairs from the aura, you would have to do it yourself because people always ask about the different procedures. Women are not allowed to sh men or women are nobody is allowed to show their aura without a reason. So you could not go to somebody to do that job for you. If a suitor knows your age, do you need to tell them that your hair is dyed? No, no, that is not one of the things that you have to tell a suitor. 
If a person due to unattentiveness for a split second belittles black hair and then remembers that the Prophet ﷺ had black hair and immediately stopped, is he or she liable? They should just make istighfar. Is Abdullah ibn Zubair's Khilafah considered Rashida? Uh, yes, but it's not treated as a Khilafah because he only had one city. Okay. Is it true that Imam Malik started doing Isbal in Salah because of his injuries after being in prison? One, Malik was never imprisoned, and two, he never broke his arm, and that's just one of those things where uh, some people, they read about the Maliki Madhab from non-Maliki books, right? Like, regularly, I see people commenting on Madhabs from maybe Salafi books, where that Salafi was not trained in that Madhab. When you, when you enter a Madhab, it's like you're entering, like, into a whole world. And there are Dozens upon dozens upon hundreds upon thousands of books, all strengthening the madhab and trying to get really get to the point of what actually occurred and what was actually said by the imam and what his methodology is and what is the correctest and most sound position. So it is unfair to that madhab for someone to l try to learn about. I'm not saying this person did, but many other do try to learn about a madhab from outside the madhab. Right? That's not right. Uh, yeah, the if if he if he had broken arms, what, they, would they be broken straight? Right. You broke your arm. Wouldn't they put you in a cast like this? When was the last time you saw someone with broken arms? What did he have casts down? Wait, wait. When was the last time someone broke his arm and you saw a cast down? Right. Oh, they dislocated his shoulder. Wait, you think they didn't have enough medical technology to put a sling? Anyone with a dislocated shoulder or a broken arm, wouldn't they put a sling? Like, he would end up like this if he broke two, both shoulders, right? Dislocated his shoulders. He had slings. He would have slings like this. I, am I getting this wrong? No one dislocates their shoulders and then is like this. Like, they didn't have the basic medical attention. Could you look up what is someone who dislocates his shoulders, as they say? So how was he tortured? They yanked at him? Like, what was the torture in your mind? They were yanking at him? Like, you, you got to put your hands on your knees. You got to put your hands on the floor. Yeah. Like, how's he, you know? How is this happening? It's actually hilarious when you think about it because in no situation do I know that breaking the arm ends up in and putting it in a straight cast. It's always in a sling. All right? Look it up, big guy. That's what I'm thinking. But in, either way, and it never happened that Maddox was in jail. It never happened that he was hit. Right? Let me see. And it never happens that um, that, that that this was the reason that he, he did Isdal al -Yadayn. On the note of fiction, is there any benefit in reading it? I can't. Okay, look. This is hilarious. Look, I'm going to go to this one. If you were to break your elbows or your wrists, this is how your arm would be. Okay? If they broke, if the if you broke someone, any part of the arm, every single picture here cast for the arm is a bent arm. Okay? It's in a sling or it's, it's bent. There is no such thing as the straight cast. Okay? You see that? He would actually be praying qabd. I want you to show me one time a person breaks his arm. All right, so here's a bigger picture. This person broke their wrist and their arm, and they have a cast around their elbow and their wrist. Yeah, so this should actually... Besides that, it never happened in the first place. If it happened, let's think here. People break their arms all the time. You see people with broken arms and dislocated shoulders all the time. You never see anyone casting like uh, with a cast down like that. It's sort of just funny to think about it. Where, why are there a lot of Habayib from Yemen? The origin of those shiuch and what they call themselves, they call themselves Habibs and Habayib. And they're from Yemen. Okay. 
How do you put less hope on the means like treatments? Okay. By making more dhikrullah. And remembering all the time that the benefit that la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Constantly repeating la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah and acting upon it. In other words, doing ruqya. Making dua for shifa. Because when you act upon something, you start to believe it more. And you may see it too. Okay. Why does the Coptic church say that they're oppressed? Yeah, the Coptics of Egypt are always saying that they're oppressed. Okay. Well, I've never seen a van filled with Coptic Christians. i never seen somebody go to a Coptic church and then look behind him because he's being followed and trailed. Right? But it's fashionable to be a whiner and a victim these days. That's the truth. Okay. Me and my husband both got our dickerings and find it very useful. Yeah, I love the dickering. Oh, that person owes me a dickering, right? I'm making an order of two more. Order one, but the person who lost it has to pay you. I'm going to shift here. I'm going to shift the debt from me to you. I'm going to have to pay you, right? Because now they got to pay the price. I'm not accepting this. They're paying the price. Sometimes you can forgive someone, but when someone needs to learn a lesson, they're, they're, the best thing for them is to pay the price. I worry about how technology, usage of cards, etc., is accelerating the cashless society. Yeah, the cashless society is a bit scary, the fact that you can just shut someone off. If everything is on tech and everything is... That's why I think people are supporting Bitcoin as a currency, which is not a currency right yet. It's more like a stock. But the people people support that because it will disallow governments from just shutting you off and freezing. I think that's... that's. But the problem with Bitcoin is that it's not being treated as a currency. No one wants to get rid of their Bitcoin. It's not being used as a currency. Can you give us a must-read English book for students of Dean? Uh, a must-read book. I'm not going to say it's for students of Dean, but I am saying for Westerners in Aqidah and who are dealing with thoughtful issues, you really should get this book. Okay, The Divine for Critical Minds, Inquiry into God's Existence. It answers so many questions. You could really tell the person spent years on this and then when they put their book down or when they put their thoughts down it re resulted in that book Lam Sikh says uh, what do you think of between AI and, and Islamic knowledge yeah probably you will have a lot of uh, excuse me uh, I got a little cold here uh, you probably will have a lot of these little things um, websites solely made by AI and a Muslim will have to really double and triple check everything that they learn. Well, not just AI. AI right now, mid-journey can produce amazing pictures. And it looks exactly like an actual physical human picture, right? So how long is it going to take for AI mid-journey to make clips? Make a clip of Omar Abbasi giving a fatwa on Istarul Yadain, right? It's... Maybe not Omar Abbas because he doesn't have a lot of footage online, right? Make make a um, clip of Shadi al Masri promoting the Hanafi Madhab. Lies you're going to see all over the internet, right? Lies all over the place. There's going to be so you got your, there's going to be have to be a way for people to check if clips are actually authentic or not. Right now, by the way, Hanafi Madhab is fine, but lies lies because the clip isn't there but already as is we have these lies of things being taken out of context for example a high speed chase and then someone says you know catches it from 2005 puts it on as news that happened in your backyard because it may the street may look the same or something like that and spreads a panic in the town when it happened years ago in a different city completely that's an example of how it's already, this, these lies are happening already. Oh, the zoo break-in in France turned out to be a lie, right? It turned out to be a zoo breaks all over the world across 10 years. And they put it all together 
and said it all happened in France. I, st- I still believe it. Huh? I don't, w- don't want to believe it's fake. I know. They have to ruin the fun. One thing that's like super funny and it's actually uh, like useful is, uh, you know, Twitter community notes? Yeah. I like on the bottom of fact check everything. I'll be like, this is actually false. This is blah, blah, blah. And it's like yeah. super hilarious. There's like a whole page, I think, on Twitter. Like uh, it's just posting like funny community notes. People getting exposed. And is like, it accurate? It's so funny. Yeah, it's accurate. So like, you know how like on Twitter you have like, you know, women promoting their, their haram stuff. Yeah. Like all that. Yeah. So then they like lie and stuff. And then the community will call them out. Actually, this woman is doing this. Wow. This <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. Twitter has that now. Yeah, Twitter. That's official like, Twitter. Or is it Twitter like page? Now, I guess. Yeah. Yes. But the no, official like, Twitter. No, no. Yeah. Like it actually goes under like every single post. Oh, like, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So um, what do you guys think of the new X besides just the brand has changed? That's it. But how do we talk about it? X. It's still Twitter. I don't know how to talk about it. Like, like I'm Xing. I re-Xed it. Uh, why don't you speak much on domestic violence, not just physical but psychological? How does a woman save her marriage when the man has cut all forms of communication? Well, if you're if it, is not the marriage made for security, right? What is the job of the husband to provide sustenance and security and sakina? And physical um, uh, relationships, right? Relations. So if one of these are not there, then uh, the imam can separate between you two. That's pretty much how simple it is. If all of them are there, but you can't stand the man and you don't like him, then you do a khula. You have to give him some money and he divorces you, right? Just like you took money to enter the marriage, which we call a dowry. You have to make a payment to get out of the marriage while he hasn't done anything wrong. So in the case of domestic violence, this is a situation where the main purpose of marriage, which is one of them is security, is not being upheld. In fact, the opposite is occurring. So therefore, that's one of the reasons why an imam can separate. In the absence of a judge, it's an imam. Take that, do that. So let's say a woman says, well, I can't, I have no way to live. All right. But I don't like those uh, types of you're cl- re- reducing the reality. Why would you reduce the reality? It's very possible. Anything is possible if you put your mind to it, in my, in my personal opinion. Um, domestic violence we can get. There's an organization here in North Jersey. What are they called again, Omar? Okay. Muslim Domestic Violence Organization in North Jersey. All my... North Jersey friends know about it and they're, they're part of it. What is it called? SubhanAllah. I can't, can't believe I forgot what it's called. Care? No, not care, no. It's. SubhanAllah. Wafat House. Look up the Wafat House and let's get a spokesman from the Wafat House. W F A E? Yeah. Wafat House. No, that's the name of the radio station. But it's called the Wafat House. Look it up. When, wo- when woman one sends food to woman two in a Pyrex dish, the Pyrex dish is expected to be returned, of course. Can woman two use the dish on her own prior to returning the dish? She cannot. And if she breaks it or stains it or ruins it, she owes her a brand new dish. Could you invite Suleiman Van Ale on the stream? Why not? Put it down. down. Ex Salafi and a psychotherapist. And he master of the ten qiraat. Do you think DYU, what is that? Do you understand? I don't know what DYU means, but think is what the following A is referring to. Qala Rabb Qala Rabbuna what does that mean? Because everything is existent in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he gave it its physical reality in this life. Everything existent in the, uh, in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including when this would come into physical existence. When that time comes, he manifests what he already knew.
What is the Higgs boson? Said man, can you look that up? Someone's talking about the Higgs boson. Fundamental particle associated with the Higgs field, a field that permeates the entire universe and gives mass to other fundamental particles. Is this something that is theoretical or what? Let's look it up. The Higgs boson. Okay. When you began your sac- journey of sacred knowledge, did you consider going to Al-Azhar? Not really. I didn't I didn't necessarily like the vibe in Egypt. I felt it was a bit rough around the edges and hectic and lacking in, in peace of mind. So I never actually considered to go to Azhar. Will you be offering Aqidah? Yes, we are offering Aqidah classes, Ashari Aqidah classes from Sheikh Murad, and we have a, a new guest teacher. We're going to announce him later. What if one's parents kill their passion due to envy of their siblings? Oh, Fulan and Fulan is a daughter, is in so and so field. You're doing nothing in your life. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. You really got to get away from that completely. You have to learn how to, 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 to have a mental blockage of that negativity. You really have to. Okay. Lam Sikh. Brings the apology. Well done, Lamsikh. Okay. He brings the apology. Lowering the gaze includes what's on the screen, and that is correct. And you can go on uh, Google Chrome, and you can get an app, an add-on called Tahir. Its symbol is the letter Ta, and you could turn it on and off. Whoa, shoot. The size of that thing. Get that, bro. G- give me a towel or something. Give me a rag. What is that? A massive mosquito or what? Omar's going to war in the studio. A massive... I don't even know what that is. Is it a wasp? That's a problem. Yeah, keep your your weapon handy. How can a UD student be a good mentor for a high school student? You can hang around at the youth events, volunteer, and try. Oh, there it is, right in front of you. There it is. Boom. Oh, swing and a miss by a Bassie. There it is. You got it? Oh, if you, got, if you guys saw the war that's going, you got it? Nice job. Nice job. Yeah. Is there an English-speaking female scholar that you recommend? Sheikh Rami's wife is an English-speaking scholar. Tamara Gray is an English-speaking scholar. Sheikh Rami's wife is Dr. Uh, um, Rani Awad. When Cain and Abel gave sacrifices to Allah in the form of harvested food or meat, it was taken up by Allah. What is the meaning of this or significance of this? The, the one that Allah accepted was burned. That's how it was, how acceptance was conveyed to the people back then. It was burnt. What should we do with shampoo? It has alcohol, and sometimes it goes in my mouth. That alcohol you you can ignore, because that's uh, yeah. We're gonna go rely upon the Hanafi method in this, and even some of the Madikis hold that too in Algeria. So you can just use the shampoo. Satan's goal is to maximize human suffering. Is that true? Yes, it is 100% true. And that's why Satan, Satan the satanic, a, a system of economics that perpetuates debts and more debts in the world is not a good system. Okay. How are people disobeying God not enjoying life? They seem to be living the best life according to them. Yes, that's because also, first of all, there's two parts of this. First of all, in a situation where people don't know something is wrong, then they're active, then they don't have the 
the the sin of actively disobeying. Like they're not trying to disobey. So in his mind, and according to his conscience, he's he's doing fine. He's not doing anything bad. Yet, at the same time, he will suffer though the consequences of this wrong action. Not because it's his punishment, but the wrong. Who's knocking at the studio door? The wrong action does always have bad results. Right. So wrong. So you look at all these. Who's who? My car. I parked on the side. I parked right behind you. I think. Right. Okay. Uh, when someone commits an, uh, or uh, does something wrong, that action is forbidden because it ha- it leads to bad consequences, right? So that consequence doesn't go anywhere, whether you're whether you were you did it innocently or not, you're going to suffer from it. Someone drinks, not knowing that it's sinful against God, they don't have the sin of trying to disobey God, but they will suffer the consequence of drunkenness, right? So. When you see someone happily in disobedience, yeah, that's now, right? But when the receipts come due, they're not going to be so happy. And that's why a lot of people, they have, all these Hollywood guys have great life in the beginning. We fast forward to when they're 15, 16, 70, it's not so great. A lot of questions coming in here. Um, is alcohol containing, ma- containing mouthwash allowed? Again, the, the, it's, um, that's something where if you take a lot of it, you can get drunk, so the answer is no. Yeah, he, he, alcohol containing. Yeah, alcohol dash containing should be. All right. Can you recommend an online Quran teacher, says Ummahu? Um, MEI. Yes, uh, I think that you should take ArcView Kids because we got, we'll get the Quran teacher for you, right? And you could deal with straight with us. Plus, you can have fiqh and aqidah cl- and sira classes. ArcView Kids is going to be launched soon, this week or next week. Okay. And the classes will start later in the term. All right. Where should new Muslims go to learn Arabic? Says Kenneth Leachman. Likewise, we will be having ArcView Arabic. Uh, ArcView Kids and ArcView Arabic both will be um, launched very soon. And ArcView Arabic has beginners, intro, uh, uh, beginners, intermediate, and advanced. Okay. Where can we get this book? Uh, says Khalil this book which I've recommended people to get and read The Divine for Critical Minds by Rehan Zaidi it's got to be somewhere online the publisher is a roomy place publication Okay, really easy to read and I'm all about slow drip education of Ilm al-Kalam so that the doubts of philosophers and even the doubts that would come up without a philosopher, from your own reading of mutashabihat or something, or questions about qudra, uh, or makr, right? Qudra is divine ability and divine power. Makr being divine trickery or so, and so some may translate it as. Those questions may come up without a philosopher. You need to have answers to those, so that once your aqid is pinned down strong, now you're actually worthy of now receiving a rocket ship like if the land is clear the sky is clear the land is strong you can receive a rocket ship now when that person goes into ibad and tasawwuf they soar and what they could do for other people too of removing these shakuk and these doubts uh omar bring your mic closer and wiggle it so that it could be uh make sure that your your sound is getting through i think it's an issue with uh, the settings or something Really? Yeah, I don't know. Because it's at full volume and I'm not even far. Wow, that's yeah. weird. I don't know. I'll Maybe the, the mic itself needs to be swapped yeah, out. Yeah, I think uh, I'll have to know about it. Yeah. Maybe the mic. Settings. 
How does one make the reality of the hereafter urgent in one's heart? We treat it as a faraway event, says Simply Saleha. Yeah, so I'm telling you how to do it. What is the akhirah, first of all? It's Allah taking you to account, right? It's facing bad things because of what we did here. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be in the akhirah. So the best way to have that kind of taqwa is to recognize, and this is a type of ma'rifah here, recognize that these bad events, these bad things happening will actually punish me in this life before the next. Study people in their late phases of life and the fitan that they have, the tribulations that they have, you'll always find it actually links back to things that they did when they were in their 20s or their 30s or their 40s, right? Like things don't happen for no reason. Perm I, I, things happen for no reason tend to be maybe short term, let's say, right? Like a, a random car accident. But when we're talking about the major things of life that have completely altered your life, 99% of the time, it may be a result of our own actions. Like, for example, a man who's 50 years old and is ignorant and is made fun of now by people who are learned. A 30-year-old who's learned. You said something at the dinner conversation. All the 30-year-olds laughed. That's a terrible thing that happens to somebody, right? Why does it happen? It didn't happen just for no reason probably happened because when you were 20 and 30 and 40 you never bothered learning you never bothered reading right how about you look in the mirror and you hate what you see why did that happen probably because you refuse to exercise refuse to stop drinking soda refuse to start stop doing bad things to your body and do good things to your uh, for your health so the major things of life tend to be just a delayed lag, okay, of your past behavior. When you view life like this, you actually become extremely disciplined because you don't, we're not going to wait until akhirah to get our feedback loop. It's going to happen now. How about people who have, they go into a mental crisis when something bad happens. Chances are, the reason that that happens is because in the good times, they were very weak in remembrance of Allah. Okay? So, that's where we're not going to wait until Akhirah. We're not going to, don't do that. As if all the things happen and then the loop comes back to us in the afterlife. No, no, no. You have to start visualizing it that it's going to come back to you in this life. And that really helps you. And in, in, in essence, it's almost the same thing. Although we don't disbelieve in the Akhirah, okay? But we actually, um, it's the same concept in that it's, it is Allah bringing us back what we deserved or what we brought forth, okay? Allah doesn't bring us back what we brought forth only in the Akhirah. He brings it back here too. So it is a form of taqwa. What is your take on a dawah focused motivational speaker? I admire Tony Robbins for energizing people, but I would really like a Islamic version. Yeah, those guys are they're they're good, but very limited in my personal opinion because all they have is the dunya and they have only ob observation to go by. When we have revelation and we also have so much knowledge about the soul and so much uh, knowledge about uh, the akhirah, so I think that a Muslim. Uh, who goes that route will have a lot more. But they do have um, some good things they talk about. Are the MBFs open to the public? Yes, it's open to a public, and if a woman goes, she got to go with a mahram because it's a very small space. Okay. Or, for example, if my wife comes, then let's say another family wants to come and they don't have uh, like a husband, but at least you have to, I'm like, my wife will be here if she can come. Sometimes she comes. Abdullah Ibrahim, is this rap lyrics? 
No doubt. 42 back paying for 24's actions. Humble, humble, humble. Is it a rap lyric or something? No. Because it sounded like, huh? Yeah. I don't know, but, but I know what he's basically saying. When you're 42, that's you're tasting the results of your action in your 20s. That's true. Dealing with insecurity if it comes from constantly holding one's soul into account. Well, muraqaba should not lead to wiswas. That's a summary of it right there. Your muraqaba of yourself, you're taking yourself to account, should not lead to a wiswas. Okay, should not lead to you driving yourself into a into a a negative state. How do I build up mercy and tolerance for people around you? Oh, we the reason the the way to build up mercy and tolerance is to ask yourself what you get out of it and to realize that you yourself will get a lot out of being uh, uh, calming your anger down you yourself will get a lot out of it so when you yourself calm your anger down against someone who really deserves your anger right or that you don't love you will be able to calm yourself down as well, that's practice for when you have to cal to calm yourself down with the people you do love. Because there will be a day that someone you love bothers you, like your kids. If you don't know how to control your anger, you will permanently destroy that relationship. Okay. So that's why use you use that as um, a practice. Calm my anger with this person because... I'm actually going to one day be angry with someone I do love. And if I don't control that, I'm finished. So use it as a practice. Consider it as a practice. All right, let's close out with dhikr and dua. You got dua and nur there? Yeah. All right, good, good, good. Charger, yeah, take this. All right, it's up. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma j'alli nooran fi qalbi wa nooran fi qabri wa nooran fi sam'i wa nooran fi basari wa nooran fi shari wa nooran fi bashari wa nooran fi lahmi wa nooran fi dami wa nooran fi idhami wa nooran fi asabi wa nooran min bayni yadayya wa nooran min khalfi ونورا عن يميني ونورا عن شمالي ونورا من فوقي ونورا من تحتي اللهم زدني نورا وأعطني نورا واجعل لي نورا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Oh